Howdy, folks. Hey, I'm over here, and I'm going to introduce you to somebody. And we came up to, and we're in New Mexico, on our way to Utah, y'all know. Well, we stopped off, we saw a sign for volcano and ice caves. I wasn't going to let that pass. So we stopped off here and, and uh, took a hike up to the volcano and everything. And Sean let me interview him and tell y'all about the history because it's just absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn this around and see if I can get us both on camera here. Here's I don't know I'll see if I can adjust it here. There we go. There's enough of us. And uh, we're not live or anything. We're just okay. Recording. Yeah. That's it. So why don't you go ahead and tell us what this place is and all about it? Well, this is Ben. They call it Bandera Volcano and the Ice Cave. Mm. Um, this is, if you look up, on the computer, you can find what they call the chain of craters. Right. This is sort of the head of the chain of craters right here. Uh, the eruptions were approximately 10,000 years ago, uh, as far as people know, their best guess, I guess. And um, yeah. when this volcano erupted, it's a cinder cone. Okay, so there was lava flow over the top, and there was also, uh, at the initial eruption it blew out the side of the mountain and created a lava tube it goes for 17 and a half miles from here okay uh, now over a little bit of time the top of those lava tubes fall in and that's what happened and one of those cave ends created a niche that the ice caves in so, oh, okay. um, basically this volcano made it possible for the ice cave to be here right. and that's what's so unique about it it's so close and it's accessible right. Um, from what I'm understanding from people, you know, more knowledgeable about all that than me, that uh, ice in the lava tube is not at all uncommon. Um, but once moisture gets down in there, if it actually sits for a while, it, at some point it's going to freeze and right. there's nothing to thaw it out. Yeah, because it gets cold. Down. It, right, and it gets cold, winds so pull right. down over it all the time, and that's kind of what happens here. And uh, basically, it's covered by the mountain, so the sun never shines on it. Now, the, the rim of the volcano, you said it was 800 and what? Eight, uh, 842 feet down it, to the bottom. Yeah, deep. Literally, and yeah. The, and the, you can see the trees down the bottom. Exactly. Right? Now, I'll, I'll put pictures up and stuff. When you do that, so, yeah, those trees that you see in that yeah. picture down in the crater are these huge ponderosa pines. Yeah, right yeah. yeah. the ponderosa so. pines. That they're up to like three hundred feet tall or something, and they're down. They're down. Yeah, they're big around us. This table. Yeah, big around this table. Yeah. yeah. So um, now, what I saw was really interesting, and fascinating. One of the things when I was taking the hike up there, and uh, yes, I did make it. So don't make fun of the He did. Um, <laughs> but um, was the twisted? Mm -hmm. What what is that? Well. Uh, nobody really has a definitive answer, and the, kind of the logical thing to me thinks is that tree was stuck growing in the lava. Yeah, it there's no like hardly any nutrition in there yeah. for it to get to, and it's moisture, and it's basically something that's kind of starved to death its whole existence. Right. I have trees on my property just ten miles west of here that literally actually grow like that too. When you cut them and you go to split firewood, they split ring circles around them instead of splitting in half. Yeah. They come off and it curls around the stump. And it's I think that's just, uh, the desert effect right. that they've starved for everything, water and yeah. nutrients. Um, that's my you know uh, idea. Nobody else really has come up with anything as to why that tree grows like a screw out of there. I, I, know, know. A, I know a couple of arborists so I'm gonna reach out. Go. Yeah, I'm gonna reach out to them and see if they and see if they if yeah. I'm just full of it or well, whatever. Yeah, but, what the explanation yeah. is? It might just be the brink, the type of tree. I don't know. Yeah, um, I don't know. It yeah. might be like you said, the climate, or you know, the the environment, the habitat, and where it actually sprouted. Yeah. And then over time, you know, those roots are trying to spread out. Well, right. It's hard to do in the lava rock. Yeah. Um, and probably, uh, you know, I don't know uh, some of those. Trees, I don't know exactly how old they are, but I'm, I guess basically if you're starved your whole yeah. life, then yeah, something's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, no doubt. And that's a pretty unique little scenario there too. But um, yeah, that, that's my best, uh, closest guess on Now, that. When, when you, because I want to, now, the ice, what I thought was, was and I know we're kind of jumping around here. That's okay. But the, uh, well, you know what? Let's just start from the beginning. Okay. So, why don't you tell us the, the history that you know about the place? Okay. Um, well, because I know. Because the pottery is fascinating and everything, exactly. the whole thing. Right. And, and what, 
this whole thing, once it actually happened and there was ice in there, uh, that's a water source out here in right. the middle of where there is literally no surface water at right. all. Okay, except when it right after it rains. But um, so uh, when the the first people found this thing, I'm sure that it was a, a total oasis. Yeah. We don't have any kind of definitive proof. My theories, and I've studied the Native American uh, whole situation my whole life is something I've had interest in. Um, and they were obviously the first ones to, uh, you know, to find this. Right. Um, but if, if people know about Chaco Canyon, uh, that's just north of us here as a crow flies, maybe not much more than a hundred miles from here. Um, and somewhere around, I forget the dates, but somewhere around the year 1,000, 1100 or something, they went through a tremendous drought, lasted 30 or 40 years. There used to be a little river that ran down through where their settlement was, their Pueblo was. And it went on down into the desert and disappeared. So right. th at that point, those people went literally in every direction. Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, looking for water. Right. Um, Go ahead. To. Uh, uh, that Pueblo, when that happened, that was the largest population, as far as I understand, anywhere in the country at the time. And all of a sudden, those people disappeared, and it's never been re-inhabited again. It's that yeah. water went away, and... Um, and so I think those people were probably the first to come here looking for water. Well, there's a spring over here, just the other side of uh, the road that you came in on, mm -hmm. and it's called Aqua Fria, and it's literally, it looks like the, the volcano itself, only it's a miniature. It's a <laughs> cone that comes up out of the lava bed, and then there's water coming out of this one instead of lava. Now, there's not much water in it anymore. Apparently, that little spring's about to dry up, but back in the 1800s, um, it was a definite spring year-round water well, yeah. supply, basically. So uh, all the airheads, there was a lot of people over there. All the yeah. airheads that are in the museum there were found over there by the water area. I've discovered in rock hunting over there that in the wintertime, they have a perfect location. The mountain, the volcanoes on the west side, which blocks the predominant wind, um, so they had uh, protection from the wind, and then when the sun, as soon as the sun hits the horizon in the morning, it's shining in there, and it heats that whole little valley up, which is, that whole little valley is a lot of rock, so <laughs> um, they had a great little place over there, and it's only like four miles from here. They may have been over there and then wandering around. Nobody knows, because nobody right. was here. Right. Who actually came here first, you know, right. so... Uh, but that's my best guess, just because of the timelines and all that. Um, you know, like I say, Chaco Canyon basically disappeared, um, and it still, you know, has never been reoccupied after the water. Went right. Away. So this was a water supply in the middle of the desert. Um, that ice was a bonus. Uh, you know, and really they discovered refrigeration and all, right. and all that. Um, so, uh, this has been an oasis ever since that first guy <laughs> that came here. Right. Found it. It's like, whoa, got to go tell everybody else. So. That's why we have the several different kinds of pottery in the museum. I know all of that was found right basically around the entrance to the ice cave. Yeah, why don't you tell us who found it? Uh, well, the first guy that, as far as uh, American, non-native, right. would probably have been Debbie's great-great-grandfather, Manuel Antonio Candelaria, who is one of the most interesting. Uh, never got to obviously know the guy, but from what I do know of him, uh, he had a very colorful just life full of all kinds of exciting things so okay. um his parents died when he was nine years old he was orphaned they died from some flu right he's wandering around in his yard in cabrera new mexico and the navajo come by and take him home with them wow um and nine years old now he's captive and they take him and he lives with them for a year a year later um, of course, the Navajo and Apache, both Athabascan, so they can communicate their right. languages real similar. And they were gambling, and he got lost in the gambling match to the Apaches. The Apaches took him back to uh, Concho Valley, uh, Arizona, which is about halfway between here and Phoenix, uh, as you go the back way through the mountains. Basically, the White River Apache right. um, reservations right there, too, so... Um, lived with them for 10 years. One of the Apache mothers adopted him because his parents had died. Mm -hmm. um, lived with them for 10 years. By that time, he was 19. He was one of the guys, one of the really? tribe. Um, and uh, had the ability to come and go at will. He wasn't like a captive anymore. Yeah. He was, you know, one of the gang. 
and somebody brought back a captive girl that he knew from before he got captured. And so he, I guess, the more he, he got to thinking about that, he brought her back and got her back to her family. Um, came back to civilization at that point in time. Started a homestead over here that's about four miles through the mountains from where we're sitting right now in 1888. Uh, the foundation is still over there from where he lived in his house and the trading post. Right. Um, and this is over by that spring and all that that I was telling you about where that was heavily populated because we found a lot of airheads over oh, there. Oh, well, so, absolutely. I mean, uh, that, they're going to they're gonna congregate there. Yeah. And the other thing is there's a lot of game up here. I mean, right. Especially at that time probably right. before, you know, the, there's a lot of elk and deer and bighorn sheep and pronghorn antelope, bears, mountain lions, you know, the whole bit. So... Um, there was a lot of game, and, and, and then with the ice and the water, it was mm -hmm. like an oasis that probably until, uh, I'm guessing maybe the 1700s or something, uh, you know, as as the white, whatever, encroachment right. took place in the Indians. Uh, well, this was all, this was happening the height of the Indian War. Right, right. Uh, I mean, he's, you know, in 1837, uh, Manuel was born and was captured nine years later. Right. Um, and so, uh, he came after he built the, the trading post over there, had his little homestead there and the Navajos kept coming and stealing all his stock and everything. He moved back to Concho Valley, Arizona, um, where the Apaches welcomed him back. He wasn't like, he was okay. Right. Yeah. It wasn't any deal there. I mean, he left, but, um, you know, he, he I guess still had good relationships with all them. So. Um, and lived there for quite a while. He had a son who was also named Manuel Antonio Candelaria. They did that, I guess. So, um, and he, he and his son actually started the first bank in Northeast Arizona. Wow. Uh, one point in time. And so somewhere when he was about around 1888, when he was over here, he may have been the first, like, shall we say, modern, uh, non-Native American to come gotcha. find it. Because yeah. he was so close to it, he was probably wandering around. And, you know, at some point in time, like, wow, maybe he found a pot. Nobody really knows that part of the story right. um, there. But um, but then, anyway, he left and went back to Arizona after that, lived in Concho, Arizona. And I think that's where, uh, when he died, that's where he was living. But he was almost 94 years old when right. he died after that life he had. So, um, Boy, one he of my kind of hero while. guys. Yeah, <laughs> no, right. I mean, seriously, he was a guide for Kit Carson. Uh, he took the U.S. Cavalry camel train from, I'm not sure exactly where they left. I think it was like El Paso, somewhere in Texas right. or something, to California. He was the guide and the interpreter because um, he spoke Navajo, Apache, Spanish, and I think English, too. Right. So um, yeah, he, this was in his probably 20s, 30s, right, you know, right. part of his life. Um, and had a little bit of a bad experience with Kit Carson. And uh, Kit Carson didn't want to pay him for what he <laughs> What they had agreed on, so sounds about uh, right. Yeah, and Kit Carson. So apparently they had a little bit of a discussion about that. Kit Carson threw him in jail, um, and fortunately for him, the colonel's wife at the fork was his cousin. <laughs> so uh, I realized that that was kind of a bogus thing going on. So I don't think he ever worked for Kit Carson anymore after that. <laughs> Probably not. He did no. work for the Calvary. He never did get all his money either. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, really, really colorful guy that was. Maybe probably the closest we can come to the first, uh, so we say, non Native American, right, that, right, that discovered this in the whole world scenario. So, so who's, I mean, is he the one that started this? Um, no, his trading post he built is over there. He was dead before this, okay, one. he was gone before now, it was this her was grandfather, built. right, on the other side of right. her family. Okay. Um, and uh, they had a bunch of land. Her great great grandfather on the Mirabal side. At one point, had a quarter of a million acres for wow. raising cattle and sheep, and basically from here, I guess, almost to Arizona or something, wow. um, because it takes so much land to graze right. anywhere right. around exactly. here. So, um, but uh, yeah, so that side of the family had the land, and then her the other side had the basically they were big in the cattle and sheep, and so her grandparents uh, was an arranged marriage, and they were both very young. I think uh, uh, the girl was fifteen, the boy was like not seventeen yet. So. Right. And it was an arranged marriage, um, and uh, that worked out okay, I guess. But basically, at that point, um, that side of the family, he bought this uh, land all here from the American Land and Lumber Company. Mm. And we're not really 
really sure who they were. There's one of them deals where we own this part of New Mexico. We're going to cut all these ponderosa pines. Uh -huh. and so when they were done with that, they sold it off, and he bought this. You know, he didn't buy an ice cave and a volcano. He just right. bought ten thousand acres or whatever it was out right. here. You know, to uh, to add to their uh, cattle and sheep empire. Um, and then, of course, the actual discovery. Um, of what you enjoy today and what we can still enjoy now really didn't happen until 1946, right, right. after World War II. Which is like, another interesting story. Exactly. I know. It just goes on and on. Yeah. And the family is a like, colorful, really colorful family history. And to be able to try and get back that far oh, is yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. Not many people can do that. No, not at all. So, um, but yeah, so in 1946, right after World War II, um, the grand, the great grandson of the guy that was captured, you know, by the Indians and all that, um, uh, was in the Navy, got out of the Navy in 46, was in Arizona going to NAU, I think at Flagstaff or wherever that's at, Northern Arizona University. Mm -hmm. And they had one semester to left. The family called, um, and said, well, you know, we, the, the saloon and all that had shut down, the logging stopped, the mining stopped, so basically that just dried up and disappeared. It was just sitting there. This was a shit. And so yeah, because you originally want... this was, it, it, it was, you said it was a saloon. Right, on the other side. Yeah, and this room right here was the dance floor. Right. They <laughs> added the dance floor on after he had the saloon a couple of years. Right. It was doing so well. It's like, okay, so they added this side on. And that was um, in the 1800s, right? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, the early 1900s, early 1900s. Actually, yeah, yeah. So, um, right, at, and, well, in the late 20s, uh, yeah. was when that was getting going and when this was built, um, here. And like I say, you can see that's the yeah. outside of the yeah, old the timbers, building. There. And, All this yeah. over here was added on, right? Um, every few years they kind of had the other side, they added on some too. But, um, David Candelaria came back from the Navy and, uh, came up here to see what might be here right um was just walking around and started finding big giant pots buried everywhere and, right. all, and he knew then okay we got something here um the ice cave kind of evolved there was no way to get to it so it sliding down on a rope i mean you right. saw how it was the access i don't know how they got their blocks of ice out of there because they were cutting ice out of there when this was a saloon and there was no stairs there then <laughs> the yeah. stairs were not there well they had to use so uh, pulling up ropes yeah, and the old, they had to yeah old hammered little ladders together yeah. and stuff and cuz it's all in that lava rock and you fall off that ladder man ouch so it was oh, a, yeah, that must have been quite a procedure to oh, get I that would, ice yeah. out of there but so anyway he realized this was special he stopped everything stopped the ice harvesting stopped the tree cutting basically turned it into this preserve so all those people that have been able to enjoy it since yep. then um, he found all the pottery in there that some of it ate to over 1,200 years ago. Yep. The earliest stuff goes all the way back to the Anasazi. Um, and so they had all that done scientifically, you know, right, dated right, and right. all that stuff. So, um, And basically, then he was the one that has this to where we can still enjoy it now. So, and I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's just a fascinating story. It really is. And that, you know? that one side of the family, I just... I, they need to make a movie about Manuel. I mean, that his oh, life, yeah, I don't, I don't you know, know would make it. a great Western, I yeah. think. And they don't make any good movies anymore. Mom, yeah, yeah. So, uh, not this century, anyway. Huh? Do you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, so this I'm still on the old stuff. Yeah, no, I know. That's <laughs> the only kind of stuff. I don't like all, anyway, the new stuff. So, <laughs> But, yeah, this would make a great movie, this guy's life here. Yeah, was, like I say, he was probably the one that came over and said, wow, I didn't know this was here. Right. Know? A nice cave, and we don't have any kind of, you know, proof of really of right, that. Right. We do know that he was living over there in 1888. At that point in time, nothing was happening here except cattle and sheep were grazing basically all over. Yeah, well, and the whole, um, now, because there was a course sample done by, right. by the right. university. Kent State University. Kent yeah. State University. And, folks, what you don't understand is it's over 20 feet deep now. And they've cut like 12 feet out of it back when they were harvesting it. Exactly, and, uh, and during the 30s, yeah. Right. During the Depression, this place was a boom town. Oh, here. yeah. And the rest of the country was well, really... It's like you told me earlier, ice was a commodity. Yeah. I mean, that oh, was yeah. rare. Yeah. You know? So, um, between the mining and the logging and the, and the ranching was always going on. But, yeah, that was a wild saloon could even yeah. be here, you know? So, so there was, there's something really cool, something else really cool about the ice cream. The uh, 
the algae mm -hmm. that is growing in the ice. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's Arctic, Arctic, Arctic algae, algae, and that's the ones on the information I've read and seen. Um, and the guys that are the experts on all that right. can't really explain that. It does, it's not supposed to be here, it shouldn't be growing this far south. Um, and so on our little video, even they kind of have to fess up to that. We can't really totally yeah. explain, we don't that. really don't know yeah. what's going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Uh, it's been there they did the core sample was 34 3500 years old from the stuff below that ice right. so it's been there at least that long we got a figure um that's a few thousand years after the eruptions uh but you know not really that long and that ice was probably uh once everything actually cooled all right, right. The, uh, the lava flow and all that stuff would stop, and then of course that's what that cave in of the lava tube is what created the niche that the ice cave is in. Right. So, um, and yeah, basically when he came here in 1946, there was bighorn sheephead antler frozen into the ice. Um, I was just gonna say, man, I, there's no telling what is and who right is frozen right down in there. Yeah, all that too. Yeah, yeah. and there's other. What I'm learning now, I mean, pretty much any lava tube can have ice in it. Right. If, it, if moisture gets down in there and sets and doesn't evaporate or get absorbed, right. it's going to freeze eventually. Because if not in the summertime, eventually in the winter, that cold air draft is going to be yeah. pulling zero degrees. I mean, and once you freeze it, there's nothing to thaw it out. There's exactly. no sun, there's no hot wind, and that warm air can't go down. You know, yeah. you guys know all that. So uh, it creates its own little scenario. And then, yeah, well, it's, it's a whole ecosystem. Yeah. Now. And they cut half of it out in the 30s. And then since the 30s, it's almost back to where it was. So like everything, nature, if we leave it alone, it'll fix itself and do what it's supposed to do. And I wish they so, would do that a lot. Yeah. Leave it the hell alone. Yeah, exactly. And that's what this guy realized. Whoa, right. you know, ice is cool and all that. And saloon, yeah, and everything. But this is a unique scenario. Really, I don't know anywhere in the world. You've got quite what they have here so close no. together. No. It's obvious that the volcano made the ice cape because it's in the lava tube of it, you know. So, uh, and then as far as all the other history, I think Coronado and his gang was through here. Yeah. I mean, it was one of the, it's one of the water stops out in the middle of a very dry place. And folks, this, this place it, it's it's a little off the beaten path, but yep. not a whole lot. It's twenty five miles off the interstate. Yeah, off the forty. So off I forty, yeah. Route sixty six. So yeah, yeah. and that's the other. So get thing your kicks off Route sixty six and come on over here to ice. Exactly. Yeah. Now I'm going to give you a little pre a little piece of history here. Okay. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Yep. Okay. You know he was a big game yep. hunter, adventurer. He was a badass. Started Legit. a national park thing. Yeah. All exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Before so. he, when he was doing his big game hunting and all this kind of stuff. Now the story goes, and this is in his memoirs. Yeah. That, um, there was a tracker that he worked with. Okay. Okay. And supposedly this tracker told him the story. But the general consensus of what ha of what we think it really was was this was not a story told to him. This was something that happened to him. Oh, okay. Um, but what happened was the the story goes that he this tracker that he worked with told him that um, he had a client and they were out, and his client was killed by a bigfoot creature. Hmm. Um, so, but general consensus is we probably we think that because there's nothing heard from from Bomber the 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 the, the track yeah. which saw it. Yeah. So we think what may have probably been the real story is Roosevelt was with the tracker when the tracker got killed. Right. So, but yeah, it's kind of neat. That's in his that's in his uh, in his memoirs. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of weird that Bigfoot was mentioned way back then. Yeah. Right. And then. Then he starts the, the national parks, right? And the rumor is that he started the national parks to give these animals, give a place to be. animals or people, however you want to look, right? A place to be is a place to be. Well, yeah. and I'm once, you know, one of the things that I guess, as far as in my mind, I hear all the time out there. You can find it on YouTube and right. everything about all the people that just go out in these forests and stuff in California and Oregon and disappear. Right. Know, right. Okay. Now. Surely somebody's messed up and falling off something, whatever. Absolutely. Some people, this and that. 
But I mean, everyone, and there's so many of those yeah. kind of reports. That's when I first came on to that, it was on YouTube too. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, whoa. You know, like thousands of people have yeah. disappeared yep. out in, you know, and somewhere and again. just out here, yeah, all over the country. Yeah, just yeah. any national park, really. I mean, oh, um, yeah, oh. but uh, and, and you know, and that takes us right back to something I want to talk about because I, I, we, me and you were talking before we started recording and right. everything, and um, I was talking to you about big, you know, I do the whole Bigfoot thing, right. phenomenon, and all that kind of stuff, um. And you told me you had a little experience back when you, the, uh, how long ago was it? Well, now this was in 2007 and it okay. didn't have anything to do with Bigfoot, well, no, but, no, it, but it had to do with something that I could not explain. So right. I guess we'll call that a UFO. That's there you go. I, I like it. I'm not going to use the new term, which is UEP or something. Right. Like that. Yeah. It was, UAP. In, it was in Mesa, right where Mesa and Apache Junction meet um, on the east side of Phoenix and all there. Right. Um, about one or one thirty in the morning, um, I lived in a subdivision, like, you know, all the houses stacked in line there. Um, went outside, and all the houses in this particular subdivision had a block wall in between, so you had a little privacy that came right. up about five feet high. So I'm standing there leaning on my wall, having me a cigarette. At one thirty in the morning, it's 104, 105 degrees. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, I, I feel a little breeze, I'm like, what? And then I don't really hear anything. All of a sudden, here is this thing, um, very large. Uh, I, yeah, I would just be guessing as to how it looked like the size of a pretty good sized plane. Right. Um, no engines whatsoever. Heard no sound, no noise, or anything except for of the wind uh, as it first approached me. And this all happened in a matter of maybe three or four seconds. Right. As it first approached me, sand blew in my eyes, and it was a totally calm night. And I'm like, what? And then I look up, and I see this thing. It looks like the flying wing, if anybody's gotcha. seen that. Gotcha. That's what what I saw of it. Um, and it was undulating. The wings were not stiff. They were, oh, like, okay. slapping off gotcha. almost, okay? And as it goes by me, and I'm like, what the... And I turn around and look, and it blew another deal of sand in my face and disappeared. I never heard engine sound. So how far off the ground do you think it was? I mean, it's blowing sand oh, in Close, it. close. Had I to mean, be low, I'm probably 100 feet. Not knowing how big it actually was, it certainly wasn't no 100 yards off the ground. Right. I know that. So, I mean, to, to kick up dirt, uh, it's got to be right. treetop low. And you could actually hear it wow. as it went by, too. And I'm like, okay, Did it have lights on it or anything? <laughs> it did. Uh, they did have lights on both sides on the wings that were different colors and blinking a little bit. And I actually think what I saw looked like people in a couple of spots where you could see into the wing. Oh, there was people wow. sitting there looking out. Now, I couldn't tell what kind of people or anything like that. Right, right. Little this all happened in just a seen a little green man. You or... know, like one, two, three, four, and it was over. Yeah. Okay? Um, and, but I know I didn't imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> The sand blowing in my face, I didn't imagine. Uh, though, when it went by, and then it literally, yeah, it, I didn't see it after that. It disappeared. Once it went right back over me, and I turned to look, and there was no evidence of it whatsoever. Then I started thinking, okay, well, it's a real hot day. You've been out working all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's There's something the, I don't know what that is. Well, and that's the thing about it is when people have these experiences, be it Bigfoot or a web or whatever. Or you know, a ghost or, or a UFO or whatever. Yeah, you you question yourself, right? You know, did I right. really see what I think about yeah. something? Yeah. You know, so that's not know, right. That then that you know, yeah that should be some kind of engine right. noise. <laughs> I mean, something holding this thing up. And so I wrote it off as uh, knowing that our government has all kinds of other oh, things no. that we don't know about. That's kind of what I wrote it off as. And wow, maybe it's some kind of new little deal where they take people on a tour and they. Ah, who knows? Yeah. You know? I mean, you know, on a plane without a any kind of an yeah. engine, or at least any kind that you could hear. So. Well, Sean, uh, I really appreciate you sitting down with me. No problem. It's, buddy. it's I, I just I love enjoyed it. this. I love this story. So. And. Uh, that's my closest I can ever come to a UFO. I can can't say I've ever found any kind of evidence of Bigfoot, but I don't. 
Yeah. Well, y'all hear stories in, around here. Bro. I've been out in mountains and up all over different parts of the Rockies right. and everywhere to know that there's all kinds of things could be out there. That we there, you there you go. There's <laughs> a lot of room out here. You know, yeah, exactly. Especially out west here. Uh, I mean, around here, yeah. you know. I oh, yeah. Care. I don't know what they do for water, but they probably, you know, uh, whatever. I'm not right. going to say that there's no way. No, so, no they're absolutely. Uh, like a lot of people do. And uh, the same, I mean, with the UFO thing, I don't know that that's what it was. And uh, But what the heck was it? I mean, it's something I totally couldn't explain. Well, that's, that's why they call it unidentified, right. you know. Right. Um, so, and and it's, it, there's no telling what it was. So yeah. I mean, like no. it could have been who knows. Yeah, you know, they they like government. It. But I, I've been an outdoor kind of nature boy all yeah. my life. Out a long time ago, I used to hunt, do all that. I don't anymore, but yeah, I mean, always out inside when I can be, wherever I'm at. And I mean, I've never run across a bigfoot, but that don't mean don't mean you won't. <laughs> <laughs> that don't mean nothing, you know. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not one to deny. Uh, totally believe in God, my creator, and yeah. knows what all, uh, you know, we don't know. We're not meant to know it. Near <laughs> what we think no. we do. <laughs> so, well, Sean, uh, again, thank you so much. Well, thank you, buddy. I really appreciate it. Glad y'all come I to this, and everybody else needs to come to the yeah. Ice Cave, Bandera Volcano and Ice Cave. They got a website. Look them up on there, and you'll see some pictures. And as this man here is telling you, it's a pretty awesome experience. It is. It's and something good. that you, if you're anywhere close to here, it's worth a little drive to come see. Well, not only that, you come, you get to meet Sean. Well, that's right. You know, and, and I'll uh, tell you all about what I know. There about. you go. I'm there you go. New stuff all the time. And y'all got some fascinating uh, stuff in here too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's unbelievable. You got, got a lot got, of local you got, petrified wood. And, yep, well, yeah, and you got the pottery here. that was found. You right. got arrowheads, the whole nine yards. Right, now arrowheads were found here. I've got rocks right behind us in the tumbler right now from around here. Yeah. And agates, jasper, opal, petrified wood. I mean, the, the place is just loaded with all that oh, kind yeah. of cool stuff. So. And when you come up here, tell them tech sent you. There you go. Tell them tech sent That's you. That's right. And, uh, folks, thank you for joining us. We'll catch you all later.